Welcome to Hamburgers and Horror, the home of meat, monsters, and more meat printed in a lab from your favorite celebrity. I'm Noah Hook, and today we're looking at Antiviral. This 2012 sci-fi horror takes place in a satirical near future in which everyone is obsessed with celebrity bodies all the way from their skin to their buttholes. The film follows Sid, the employee of a company that injects people with the illnesses of their favorite celebrities. But in the midst of betraying the company by selling pathogens to the black market, Sid winds up injecting himself with an untested virus belonging to superstar Hannah Geist. When the megastar suddenly dies from her illness, Sid faces a ticking clock as he tries to figure out who is responsible and how he can find the cure. Antiviral was written and directed by Brandon Cronenberg, the son of body horror legend David Cronenberg. We last discussed his work with my review of Possessor, and I only recently got around to watching Infinity Pool. I didn't quite love it as much as Possessor, but so far it's been my favorite horror film of 2023. So I'd say I'm a pretty big fan of Brandon's work thus far, but I hadn't gotten around to seeing his debut feature film until now. The idea for Antiviral apparently came to Cronenberg in a fever dream while he was really sick. He became obsessed with the idea that these tiny little cells have begun to invade his body from someone else's, and he combined that paranoia with the bodily obsessions that are rampant in celebrity culture. The film stars Caleb Landry Jones from Get Out and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, Sarah Gadden from Cosmopolis and A Dangerous Method, Malcolm McDowell from A Clockwork Orange and Rob Zombie's Halloween, Douglas Smith from Big Love and Terminator Genesis, Joe Pingu from Maps to the Stars and the Boondock Saints, and Nicholas Campbell from Naked Lunch and the Dead Zone. You probably recognize quite a few David Cronenberg films there. It helps to have a famous daddy. Cinematography was handled by Kareem Hussein, who also shot Possessor and Infinity Pool, as well as Hobo with a Shotgun, Firestarter, and Orphan First Kill. The score was composed by E.C. Woodley of The Dark Hours and Rhinoceros Eyes, and the film was edited by Matthew Hanam, also from Possessor and films like Enemy, Swiss Army Man, and It Comes at Night. This is a baller fucking crew for your feature film debut. Antiviral premiered at the Cannes Film Festival, where it tied for Best Canadian First Feature Film. It didn't hit too many theaters though, only making around $100,000 at the box office, and it was met by more mixed reviews from critics. Pretty much everyone agreed that the film was effectively grotesque and technically very well made, but a lot felt the characters were too cold and inhuman to root for, feel for, or care about. And that's kind of a running critique of Brandon Cronenberg's work so far. His works are unpleasant and not about likable people. The film currently has a 65 and 40% on Rotten Tomatoes, so it's done a bit better with critics than general audiences, although it does have a 3.3 on Letterboxd. Thank you so much to my patron Lee for requesting Antiviral for me to review. Based on the premise, it sounds like it's going to be totally in line with Possessor and Infinity Pool, so I have a feeling I'm going to like it. I hope y'all got your vaccines updated, because we're watching Antiviral. The movie opens on this depressed fucker named Sid. He's a sickly little dude who works at the Lucas Clinic, a company that purchases viruses, diseases, and other pathogens from celebrities and injects them into their adoring fans. Their options include actresses whose nudes are leaked on live TV, and even serial killers, but their best seller by far is celebrity Hannah Geist. This obsessed young man named Edward is here to get himself one of Hannah's many pathogens, and Sid sells him on the idea of contracting her case of herpes. How romantic. Oh god, in the mouth too? I fucking hate needles, this movie's gonna be a nightmare. Sid wakes up the next day looking like dog shit, and it seems he may be collecting some germs for later use. He listens in on an interview with the founder of Lucas Clinic, Dorian Lucas, who verbally spars with a TV host about the ethics of buying and selling celebrity illnesses to fans. 
Within his closet lies a secret room in which he does secret stuff we'll learn more about through seeing Sid at work. He uses a similar machine in a board meeting led by Dorian, who explains that these funky images are created by analyzing the blood of an infected individual. The Ready Face console somehow individualizes a virus to make it completely copy protected within a person, in other words making it non-communicable. The machine somehow scans the virus itself and creates a face for it, and there's no other face quite like it. So Herpes Boy isn't out spreading herpes to everyone, it's just for him. We meet a few more Lucas technicians, all of whom are obsessed with Hannah Geist's supposed genital deformity, along with Derek, another sickly looking technician who works directly with Hannah. Sid reuses a lot of lines to reel in customers, including this lady getting the new Aria Noble flu. As you may have suspected though, Sid has been dipping into the company's rations. He injects himself with the viruses in order to get past security, and uses himself as an incubator to resell the celebrity cells. But where does he sell them, and what do they use them for, you may ask? Well, you'll be horrified to learn that he sells them to this guy named Arvid, who runs a celebrity meat market selling products grown from the cells. Right now, Arvid just grows muscle tissue for consumption, but he aspires to eventually grow his own celebrity clones. What would the customers do with their very own clones? We probably don't want to know. Somebody has beat Sid to the punch when it comes to cracking the Aria Noble flu though, which means Lucas may have another smuggler. Oh yeah, Derek has been caught and arrested for smuggling pathogens. Well that was quick. Dorian has checked the company inventory and realized a second ready face console has been stolen, but at the moment he doesn't suspect Sid. And with Derek out of the picture, Hannah Geist is gonna need a new germ harvester. While waiting at her hotel, he runs into a technician from their rival company, Vol and Tesser, who is supposedly collecting a terminally ill man's disease. These companies have beef because Geist is by far the most popular celebrity, and she solely works with Lucas. Sid enters Hannah's very floral room, and the sick queen just chillaxes while getting her blood drawn. But instead of waiting for the illness to be analyzed and copy protected, Sid immediately injects himself with Hannah's blood. Looks like the illness is acting quickly and strongly, as Sid can't even get through the workday before desperately rushing home. He starts up his ready face and tries to analyze the virus, and Sid has some very Cronenbergian hallucinations before passing out. When he wakes up, he finds that the sample has broken his console, and he hides the dangerous contraband inside a compartment of his mini-fridge. His landlady shares that some men were looking for him and left a number to contact them, and he learns from her television that Hannah Geist has died from her illness. Uh-oh. He rushes over to the meat market, which is currently flooded with excited Geist fans. Arvid was hoping Sid had this deadly virus on hand, but he claims Lucas isn't permitted to work with lethal pathogens, so all of their stock has probably been seized by the government. Arvid agrees to check the black market for some ready face parts to fix Sid's machine, and even gives him some Geitwurst on the house. Dorian honors Geist at a Lucas Clinic memorial to her, and everyone is gossiping about what killed Hannah. Hell, she's so popular right now, people are buying viruses from her dog. Hey, it isn't cannibalism if it's grown in a lab, right? Sid joins Arvid to pick up some ready face parts, but first the butcher stops by a restaurant serving his food. Looks like the newest Geist fillets are going rancid, and Arvid promises to figure out what happened. Sid tells the Butcher that he's simply sick with an old flu variant that messed up his machine, but something tells me Arvid isn't buying that. The boys head over to this fancy schmancy black market to meet a tech pirate named Levine. While waiting, Sid finds a live video of Hannah trapped inside of some kind of room naked, offering to pleasure or hurt herself in exchange for freedom. Turns out it's just a virtual reality version of Hannah that Levine has created, and this model is becoming a popular new fad. 
Sid meets with Levine and his crew, one of whom was a recent customer of his, and the skeevy little man shows off his homemade ready face. He doesn't have the part Sid needs on hand but can get it soon, but would like Sid to make his payment up front. Yeah, turns out Arvid offered the Hannah Geist virus inside of him, and when Sid tries to leave, one of Levine's thugs knocks him out. He wakes as Arvid is harvesting a lot of blood from him, but the Butcher hopes they can continue to work together in the future, especially considering Sid is dying and he apparently knows someone who can help. Then they force him down and take some tissue from a rash on his arm before discreetly dumping him on the street. At a diner, Sid learns that Geist's mysterious doctor Abendroth has returned from holiday to conduct her autopsy, and he is quickly approached by two men. They're named Portland and West and seem to know just how bad of a condition he is in. They are taking him to meet somebody who can help and they try to assure him they aren't going to hurt him. They drive out to a big house in the woods where Sid meets Dr. Abendroth. He asks Sid if he's experiencing a variety of symptoms and draws yet another vial of blood from him and plugs it into a console that visualizes the virus's face. Abendroth says it was designed with especially strong security measures, explaining why it broke Sid's ready face. Next, he and Dev, Geist's manager, reveal that Hannah's death was a hoax. Well, kinda, she is definitely dying from this illness, noticeably bleeding from her mouth. Dev and Abendroth believe this illness was an assassination attempt against Hannah, so the death hoax was their attempt to prevent a secondary attack. She reveals this new virus is an updated variation of an old one that Hannah previously sold to Lucas, and she requests that Sid figure out who at her company would have made it. He agrees on the condition that they help fix his ready face and, you know, save his life as well, and Abendroth shares that Hannah's hallucinations are getting more intense. Of course, he's an absolute creep as well, literally growing skin grafts from Hannah and other celebrities on his arm. He believes there is a certain power within the cultural zeitgeist, and having a piece of what is so important to the collective eye makes him feel more charged. He also thinks Sid believes in it as well, seeing how he unnecessarily infected himself with Hannah's blood. Abendroth gives him some antivirals to help slow down the infection. After intensely dreaming about harvesting Hannah's blood, Sid wakes to find that his own bleeding has begun. He returns to work the next day in order to trace the pathogen's origin, and their pharmacist confirms that Derek was the only person to utilize the original strain in the past two months. Next he kidnaps Arvid using a syringe of his infected blood, but the bigger, not dying man manages to take control pretty quick. He's sorry for the way Levine handled things, also sharing that the blood he stole also fried his machine. He returns the syringe to Sid, but warns him to keep him out of this mess. Next, he breaks into Derek's apartment in search of some clues, and he successfully finds the original flu pathogen. After giving Derek's landlord a good scare, he visits his own, who's real upset about Hannah's live funeral service. Portland has also dropped off a package for him, which has the part Sid needs to fix his ready face. Turns out Derek sold the virus to Vol and Tesser, and Abendroth's sources have shared with him that the company has recently patented a very similar virus to the one they're infected with. If assassination was their goal, he's unsure of why they would claim this virus as their own, and Sid's condition has gone from bad to worse. Y'all can't tell me there isn't a horde of Swifties that wouldn't do this to Taylor if given the chance. Uh-oh, looks like Sid has some not-so-nice visitors. He wakes up in a big Geist-themed room where Levine speaks to him over intercom. He's planning to broadcast Sid's slow, deteriorating death as reality TV so Hannah's ravenous fans can witness how their hero perished. They routinely come in to draw more of his blood, and after a while he starts coughing up even more of it. Sid uses it to redecorate before he has some geisty hallucinations, and he wakes to find Levine coming in for more of that valuable nectar. But while he's busy flapping his gums, Sid manages to stab him in the gums with the syringe of his blood. 
He makes a run for it through the humongous building, which turns out to belong to Vol and Tesser. He even finds advertisements for the new killer pathogen with Geist's face all over it. He very bloodily shambles through a waiting room until a guard shows up, but he manages to take a nurse hostage with his blood. After getting to safety, he hops on a Zoom meeting with Mira Tesser, the co-owner of Vol and Tesser, and confirms that he will no longer participate in Levine's twisted TV show. She confirms the company's master plan, which was a way to get around Lucas's copyright over all of Geist's pathogens. They couldn't buy and sell her illnesses outright, so they hired Derek to infect her with their own pre-patented sickness, and retrieve it to be resold with all of the Hannah Geist hype and none of the copyright. Tesser also confirms there is a cure, but it would be costly to make. Sid says he has something to barter though. He invites her to save Hannah using the cure, which would promise a lifetime of collaborations, but sadly the poor woman is too far gone to be saved. But Sid has taken the horrible things that have happened to him and learned from them, and he has concocted an innovative new plan that will benefit everyone. We are greeted by virtual Hannah, who is excited to stay young and beautiful forever in her afterlife. Using Arvid's cell-growing technology, Vol and Tesser, along with their new employee Sid, have created a so-called cell garden using Hannah's DNA. Inside this chamber, the diseases they inject into her genetically created arm are allowed to thrive, eventually being retrieved to sell to her fans. Through this process, they can be a part of Hannah's afterlife, just as much as she'll be a part of their lives. Apparently it's a big hit. But Sid is still a sneaky little bastard, and the goddamn freak cuts open the arm in order to drink her blood. The movie ends with Sid suckling like a baby vampire, as it's revealed that this Hannah clone is more than just a clump of cells. And that's antiviral. I guess I'll get started by just breaking down what all of what we just saw means. First and foremost, this film is commenting on our society's obsessive nature when it comes to celebrities and their bodies. With the onslaught of gossip magazines, blogs, and reality television, there are certain people in the limelight whose lives have practically become a part of ours because we hear about them so often. We hear about them so often that it starts to feel like we know them. I can't tell you how many times a friend has tried to make conversation with something like, oh, did you hear Kim K did this, or Taylor Swift said this, as if they are our friends or people in our lives and their actions are going to affect me in any way, shape, or form. But as Dorian says in the film, if you are a celebrity, you deserve to be one, as something about you magnetizes your audience and pulls them in. So I'm not going to preach about who I think should and shouldn't be famous. My point is that people tend to take all of this insight into celebrities' lives a bit too personally. Fans begin to feel like there is a connection between them, despite the fact the celebrity doesn't know they fucking exist. They want to find a way to materialize that imagined connection, and where there is a demand, there will be a supply. The paparazzi boomed in the 2000s because audiences demanded these looks into the private lives of their idols, often to the point that magazines were obsessing and theorizing over every little physical change in their appearances. Sometimes it can feel pretty hard to feel bad for super rich famous people, but nobody deserves to be publicly shamed and ridiculed for aging, gaining or losing weight, or any other physical changes happening to them. But now with the internet, we can basically get 24-7 access photos and news about them, as well as being able to buy their official products, as well as being able to buy fucking things from their lives like Starbucks cups that someone dug out of the trash. You can buy used shoes, underwear, tampons, bath water, the list goes on and on and there is a market for all of it. So while I don't think we'll ever get to the stage of celebrity virus buying or celebrity meat printing, it really is not very far off from where we are now. But the film really emphasizes just how fake all of this purported love by the fans really is. 
Not a single person in this entire story gives a fuck about Hannah as a human being. Her entire existence has been commodified into a series of products sold to the highest bidder. If she was left alone in a room with her so-called fans, they'd probably rip her apart just so one of them could keep her arms or something. She has been turned into nothing more than an object for their own viewing and existential pleasure. Even Sid, who makes himself out to be above all the celebrity nonsense, can't help but feeling the same instant infatuation with Hannah that her fans do. And these moments of obsession all stem from a perceived lack in themselves that this film really looks into. Weird little incels like Edward want to feel a woman's affection, while Abendroth wants the sensation of feeling young again. These celebrity collectibles make them feel smarter, fancier, sexier. They can be less depressed with their own sad little lives if they feel like they are a part of something bigger. In this world, the celebrities through their screens are God. And I like that the film primarily portrays the really obsessive, dangerous fans as men, because that is definitely accurate. When you are reading negative comments online, especially in regards to feminism, women's beauty, age, weight, things like that, it's mostly coming from ugly little men who only feel empowered through their keyboard. But obviously not only men are to blame, and that moment with a woman obsessed with a serial killer touches on a real world fixation that has only gotten worse since 2012. So it's really interesting to see Cronenberg satirize the collaboration between celebrities and the medical industry because that's already happening today as well. Every fucking product you see an ad for has a celebrity endorsement as if an actor or popular Nepo baby has any insight on lotion or antidepressant medication. But for some reason we trust them. But in Antiviral, this world has really expanded its horizons into every possible form of commodification, actually existing within brick and mortar spaces with employees acting as middlemen. And between the hyper fixation and the technology overload, there is very little room left for actual humanity, and that loss is very visible inside Lucas Clinic. The corporation, the employees, and the customers have all lost touch with themselves and their humanity, so all they can do is fill that loss with a sexy white wall facade. Sid's entire life revolves around the concept of connection, but he has no real connection with a single human being the entire film. Injecting himself with Hannah's blood was just a desperate attempt to feel something, and Avendroth was right when he declared Sid was basically just another lonely fan. Caleb Landry Jones delivers a fantastic performance, he really feels like an empty vessel trying to be fulfilled. And my god, I commend him for all the gross shit he was willing to do, dude looks disgusting throughout most of the film. He's not a typical leading man, but I think he did a great job carrying the story and I'd love to see him in more horror films, in more prominent roles. The cinematography had a lot of that patented Brandon Cronenberg bleakness, and I'd say this is his chromatically dullest film as of yet. Everyone is so pale and frail looking, and the world around them is just varying shades of white and grey. All of the supporting cast serve their roles well, although my biggest complaint about the film is y'all gave Malcolm McDowell nothing to do. His character was pretty hyped up, but all he ended up doing was providing a bit of exposition and thematic rambling. And generally, it's a pretty slow film, all things considered. A lot of fucked up things are happening, but I wouldn't go in expecting a straight up horror movie. It's drama, mystery, sci-fi, horror, all mixed together, really falling under the Cronenberg umbrella more than anything else. And so far from Brandon's work, this feels the most like one of his father's films. His first three films have all really been centered around loss of self, which is definitely a big David Cronenberg thing as well, but after seeing all three, I can say he's definitely branching out both stylistically and thematically as time goes on. But even so, Antiviral is a very distinct direction to go, especially considering this was his directorial debut. 
The film has a lot of intriguing ruminations on celebrity fetishization, materialism-based connection, tabloid journalism, and the perverse futures of VR and cloning. It provides a solid mystery in between the body horror and medical horror extravaganza, and gives the protagonist enough time to be fleshed out. I feel like it loses steam a bit around the third act, but still manages to stick the landing. It is a cold, clinical film from top to bottom, and it really makes you uncomfortable in your own skin. Its horror is all derived from our own bizarre reality, while being able to transform its fears into something new and even more disturbing. I'd probably say this is my least favorite Brandon Cronenberg film so far, but that's more of an acknowledgement of his improvement as time has gone on more than any dislike I have for Antiviral. I'm super curious to see what his next project is going to be about, and he's really one of the most exciting directors of our time, I'd say. And I'll have to find time to cover Infinity Pool on the channel sometime soon. Well, that's about it. What did y'all think of Antiviral? Let me know down below. And what do you think of Brandon Cronenberg in general? And thank you again to my patron Lee for requesting Antiviral for me to review. I'd say this makes a great triple feature with Possessor and Infinity Pool. Be sure to join me in two weeks as we check out Jason X. That should probably be a very fun review. Thank you all so much for joining me and an extra thank you to my patrons. As always, I'm Noah Hook and thanks for watching Hamburgers and Horror. Stay safe out there. Thanks for watching my review of Antiviral. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe so you can keep up with all my horror reviews. And if you want to help support the channel further, you should check out my Patreon account. You'll be able to vote for future movies and franchises I cover on the channel. Thanks, y'all.